two, French workers' perceptions and reactions. The era of the new 30 years war, 1914 to 1945, revived slave and forced labor across Europe. In February, 1943, the Vichy regime profoundly deepened its policies of collaboration with Nazi Germany by introducing the Service du Travail Obligatoire, STO, uh, which would send approximately 600,000 male French workers to the Nazi Reich. The French commonly called forced labor in Germany slavery, esclavage, and labeled as slave drivers, negrier, the German and French officials who required their labor. Unfortunately, like the concepts of fascism, racism, genocide, and Holocaust, slavery is much abused. The 19th century American abolitionist Frederick Douglass passionately objected to the popular and progressive usage of, quote, wage slave to characterize factory workers who could move about freely had families that could not be sold and whose children were free. Although Douglas was correct on insisting upon key differences between slavery and wage labor in degrees of autonomy and freedom, French workers' use of slavery to characterize their experiences of conscription in France and labor in Germany offers insights into the revival of various types of slavery and forced labor, which European nations reestablished in their own era of violence from 1914 to 1945. Historically, slavery implies the mutually reinforcing dynamics of militarization, violence, and even torture that regularly accompany forced labor. Just as slavery and violence were inseparable in large parts of Africa, the US South, and other slave societies in, 18th, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the bloody militarization of World War I generated a rebirth of bondage uh, which endured in Western and Central Europe until 1945. In a shift from the 18th and 19th centuries, 20th century centralizing nation states desired to transform their populations and replace the private individual as slave master. These states provided forced labor for both public and private enterprises. Like slaves, forced laborers who lacked individual choice or mobility were compelled to perform the most difficult and dirtiest tasks. Their masters controlled their bodies, invaded their privacy, and restricted their sexuality. In wartime especially, male and female bodies belonged to the nation, not to their natural owner. The Vichy regime was unique during World War II because it was the only government in German-occupied Europe which approved laws that obligated its own citizens to labor for the occupier. Seeking to avoid the purer forms of slavery imposed by the Reich in Eastern Europe, Vichy bargained with the Nazis uh, to allow French forced laborers rations and salaries higher than in France and equivalent to that of their German colleagues. Thus, unlike slaves, French workers were paid. Furthermore, French forced laborers were not strictly slaves since they, did not since they did receive a contract. Although some had to wear armbands that distinguished them from the German population, their icons were less stigmatizing than Stars of David for Jews, Ost for Eastern European workers, and other degrading badges. <laughs> 
French female volunteers in Germany were not forced into prostitution. Nonetheless, the French were trapped in, quote, mass servitude, as the workers and others uh, called it. French laborers worked for a hereditary enemy who, who constructed the most complex and genocidal uh, slave society in history. Uh, with Vichy assistance, the Nazi regime enforced growing bondage throughout occupied Europe. When the Germans did not honor their pledges concerning leave, vacations, and money transfers to France, the Vichy regime proved unwilling or unable to enforce these broken contracts. Finally, as in other slave societies, stigmatization of laborers grew since much of the French public gradually adopted uh, the belief that labor conscripts could have done more to avoid their servile condition to the German foe. As the war wound down, opinion wanted heroes, not victims. The failure of the 1941 Blitzkrieg to conquer the Soviet Union brought increasing pressure on French workers to labor for and in the Reich. In March 1942, the Nazi labor czar Fritz Sokol, whom Parisian uh, workers nicknamed, the, quote, the slave trader of Europe, took charge of German labor recruitment throughout the continent. In June 1942, on the first anniversary of the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Prime Minister Pierre Laval announced the Relève program. That is, French, uh, France would send three workers to the Reich, which in turn promised uh, to send back one French POW from a pool of over one million French POWs. The overwhelming majority of workers rejected Vichy's call for volunteers to work in Germany. Although 200 to 250,000 workers volunteered to labor in the Reich, France supplied, in proportion to population, the fewest volunteers in occupied Europe. The volunteers were often unskilled workers who were attracted by the relatively high wages and rations. Many were social dropouts, marginaux, if not outcasts. 23% of the volunteers in 1940 were foreigners, and a much smaller percentage were women who were often disdained as, quote, prostitutes. Allied bombing, severe German discipline, and the Nazi reputation for brutality dissuaded wage earners from leaving France. French workers, and for that matter, peasants, remain unconvinced, as it turned out correctly, that Germany would repatriate French POWs as promised since the Reich needed their labor. French wage owners reason that laboring in Germany would liberate more German workers for the German military than free French POWs, a belief that was seconded by the POWs themselves. Since German authorities insisted on deciding which prisoners could be freed, they discharged French POWs who were older, sicker, and incapable of working. French workers again proved their astuteness as the Nazis arbitrarily extended the contracts of French labor volunteers in 1942. The Relève enjoyed more success among workers from the empire. The law of the 4th September 1942 allowed the French government, quote, in the higher interest of the nation, end of quote, to assign a job to all those of working age, 18 to 50 for men and 21 to 35 for single women. Workers regarded the law as, quote, further evidence of the enslavement of French workers. Its obligation to work introduced into metropolitan France forced labor, which was widely used in the empire, and thus completely broke with all modern French labor legislation. French collaborationists supported Laval, who argued, following the Nazi vision, 
that the new division of labor in Nazi-dominated Europe was predicated on the Germans fighting, and it was assumed, defeating Bolshevism, while the French contributed by laboring in their own country and in Germany against the Allies. The failure to raise enough volunteers, even if their numbers approached 142,000 in March 1942, 28,000 of whom were women, led in February 1943 to Vichy's introduction of an intensive labor draft for the Reich, the STO, Service du Travail Obligatoire. Uh, Vichy officials preferred French workers laboring for Germany to the alternative of unemployment. Forced labor tried to justify itself as a measure against the lazy, wazif, a category that for Nazis and their foreign collaborators automatically included Jews. Uninformed or unconcerned about their genocidal fate, public opinion demanded that Jews be included among the labor conscripts. Germans and their French partners tax those who refuse to work in Germany as, quote, egotistical or work shy, Arbeitscheuen, or loafers, Arbeitsbommelei. In response, unemployed or unemployed workers regarded high-ranking Vichy officials, collaborationist trade unions, and their armed enforcers, or miliciens, as slave drivers, once again, negrier. Uh, the resistance used similar language and condemn the STO more quickly than it did anti-Semitism or even the head of state, Marshal Pétain. The Free French from London conducted a radio campaign against forced labor in Germany, which was larger and longer than any other during the occupation. Its BBC transmissions emphasized the dangers of bombardments epidemics, humiliations, and slave soup rations, brouet d'esclaves in the Reich. The Germans conceded the broadcast to be highly effective in discouraging volunteers. Collaboration with the Reich dramatically increased the work week from 36 hours in December 1940 to nearly 60 hours during the last years of the war and lowered wage earners' living standards. Throughout the war, German authorities encouraged a low-wage policy in France. The occupier hoped that the loss of French workers' purchasing power would pressure wage earners to, uh, to labor in Germany. For the first time since the 19th century, food expenses consumed as much as 80% uh, percent of the French workers' family budget. By June 1942, the average worker in nationalized aviation had lost at least 33 pounds. Despite German threats of severe punishment, including death sentences, uh, difficult material conditions motivated strikes of French workers who, uh, at the same time, protested German, quote, slavery. Like the work stoppages of German workers during the early years of the Third Reich, French workers' strikes were usually brief, a matter of hours, to avoid a potentially terrible repression. The Germans lacked the knowledge and manpower to conscript hundreds of thousands of Frenchmen and recognized that the help of Vichy officials was indispensable. Like Mussolini's Republic of Salo from 1943 to 1945, Vichy became a vassal that traded its serfs to its German lord for certain protections. Alternatively, Vichy acted like an African ethnicity that captured slaves in the interior and delivered them to their African and European partners. Many French workers described the STO as they had the relève, that is the return of slavery by German slavers. 20% of them refused their conscription. Germans reacted by surprise raids and abductions of eligible men. Until the end of 1943, German-French collaboration and repression were largely effective in fulfilling Sokol's quotas. Although strikes, protest demonstrations, and individual avoidance occurred, most French workers did not resist their labor conscription, and the Germans regarded the forced recruitment drive at the end of 1942 as successful. 
Nevertheless, the growing refusal of labor for Germany was perhaps the first important act of mass anti-fascism in France since its defeat in June 1940, and it anticipated the Liberation's uh, restoration of wage labor. The Allies, including British and American trade unions, encourage avoidance of the STO. Uh, the powerful popular reaction against the STO's two-year corvée in the first major nation to abolish slavery dramatically reduced support for the Vichy regime and bolstered the French resistance. The STO became the most infamous French acronym of the occupation. French Protestants recaptured their historical role as an abolitionist vanguard and objected much more strongly to forced labor than Catholics who were generally much more sympathetic to the Vichy regime. Workers who refused conscription were known as réfractaires. Much to the chagrin of Paris police, the public tolerated, if not, uh, if not supported, the refusals of the réfractaires and disassociated them from what the police and much of societies still term the terrorist activities of the resistance. Obliging doctors exempted tens, if not hundreds of thousands from the draft. The massive exemptions aroused the suspicions of German authorities who imposed their own physicians whenever possible. German soldiers sometimes raided factories, cafes, and public gatherings to find and exile réfractaire. Those who hid or protected refusers could be punished in Nazi concentration camps. French workers on leave from Germany painted a somber picture of their lives in the Reich, and wage earners disbelieved the more positive images of life in Germany portrayed by the official media. Furthermore, fearing adverse publicity, which would counter their recruitment efforts in France, after 1943, the German government refused to allow female volunteers to return to France. French workers uh, were aware that when the conscripted arrived in Germany, they were sometimes subjected to a, quote, slave market, where future employers would judge them according to their physical condition. Many wage earners on leave from Germany, perhaps over 100,000 or 55% of those granted leave and approximately one third of the réfractaires avoided uh, returning to the Reich and remained in France without permission. The Reich authorities responded by suspending all leave until 15th of October, 1943. German officials continuously pressed their French counterparts to find fugitives on leave and return them to the right. Vichy's extension on the 1st of February, 1944, of the labor draft age from 16 to 60 for men and 18 to 45 for childless women intensified its already acute unpopularity. The church protested the proposed female conscription. Even if 95% even if of the French workers survived their German exile, a figure that was roughly equivalent to the Italian POWs and civilian workers, the massive Anglo-American bombing campaign against the industries of the Reich, which caused one quarter of the 25,000 deaths of the French in Germany, remained a further deterrent uh, for those subject to the labor draft. Although two-thirds of the réfractaires intended to join the resistance, only 10 to 20 percent did. Rural folk partially overcame their reputation for profiteering by hiding three-quarters of the 250,000 réfractaires, although only one-third had agricultural experience. Peasant protection showed that rural France rejected collaborationist propaganda, which labeled the réfractaire as reprehensible oisif. Uh, despite the law of 11 June 1943, which threatened jail for those helping réfractaire, the population either actively or passively protected them. The police state that slave and forced labor requires partially collapse since officials proved reluctant to report or arrest them. 
Neither the Wright nor Vichy had the means to search tens of thousands of small farms or businesses in France. Neither state controlled parts of the countryside where the Maquis, composed of groups of refractaires and resistors, took root. Unlike the Maquis of Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, the French Maquis, like the Italians who headed for the hills in early 1944, did not wish to confront the enemy militarily, but rejected forced labor for him. Thus, the Maquis in France had much more in common with the maroon communities of, es of escaped slaves who operated with the complicity of other slaves. Whether or not formally in the resistance, Réfractaire declined to become, in their words, quote, the slaves of the Reich. In 1944, the most committed French collaborationists received the appropriate name of work police, Arbeitspolizei, and were authorized to employ armed force against French workers. By July 1944, Sokol was outraged that, quote, hundreds of thousands who loitered in Italy and France defied his authority to conscript labor. In the summer of 1944, after the Allied bombings, the retreating Germans forcibly enrolled both male and female uh, workers in eastern France. Of course, it was not work that the Italian and French refractaire refused, but rather forced labor. Despite many refusals, the SDO supplied 600 to 650,000 French laborers, 7% of active male population, and the third largest contingent of foreign laborers uh, to the Reich after Russia and Poland. The French also supplied the Germans with the greatest number of foreign skilled laborers. Sokol stated, probably correctly, that France satisfied uh, German labor demands better than any occupied nation. French forced labor in the Reich was perhaps the main benefit that the Germans received from French collaboration. Let me, let me conclude. Approaching history from above, American historians of France have often emphasized the modern technocratic and institutional innovations of Vichy. Yet the dramatic decline of urban workers' purchasing power reimposed a 19th century living standard uh, by reducing workers' consumption of calories and other necessary commodities. To aid the victory of Axis slave power, which uh, Vichy assumed would win the war, it reintroduced forced labor into France to a much greater extent than any other regime since 1802. As in Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and the Soviet Union, in the name of empire and especially the nation, Vichy used violence to restore feudal forms of labor and a state corvée. When Vichy's national revolution abandoned the famille and patrie of its motto, only the servitude of travail remained. It placed its own people in bondage during the culmination of the Thirty Years' War of the 20th century. Thank you.